This presentation is on sideline experiences, what to bring, what to have in your doctor's bag, and how to perform on the sidelines. This is based on experiences that I have had over my career. My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine and work at the University of Kentucky. There are consensus statements, numerous ones exist, but the one that I think is most related to this topic is being a team physician and also sideline preparedness. These statements have been developed in collaboration with six major professional associations. These statements can help you as a sports medicine physician talk about your role and your extra preparedness for the sideline based on your being members of these societies and also based on the decisions made by these societies. These societies include the American Orthopedic Sports Medicine Society, American College of Sports Medicine, the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, the Academy, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and the AOASM. These are available on the ACSM website, as noted below. And this consensus statement, again, may help you relate and describe to administrators, coaches, what special talents you bring to their sideline. Team physician, it was a decade of work, selected issues for the adolescent athlete, injury and illness prevention, psychologic issues, concussion, female athlete issues, sideline preparedness, and then this is the team physician consensus statement, and there's also one on conditioning. So I would encourage you to look at these important consensus statements. Team physician consensus statement is to provide physicians, school administrators, team owners, the general public, and individuals responsible for medical care with the guidelines for choosing a qualified team physician and an outline of the duties expected of a team physician. Establishing the ground rules for a team physician and his or her performance. The goal of the team physician is to ensure that athletes and teams are provided the very best medical care. What is the definition of sideline preparedness? Identification of and planning for medical services to promote the safety of the athlete, to limit injury, and to provide medical care at the site of practice or competition. Again, this is an ACSM publication, Medicine, Science, Sports, and Exercise. So what do we put in our bag? The medical coverage of games and events, what's in the bag and on the sidelines. This is something that is very important. You need to know where all these things are in your bag. You need to know what's in the bag. Dave Olson has written a great paper on this. This was presented at the Team Physician course in 2009. And I think it's very important for you to know what's in your bag and what should be in your bag. This is a list from Orthopedic Knowledge Update, Medical Care of the Athletes, which was written by Eric McCarty from Colorado. The medical bag, what is in the bag. So this, I think, is an important resource for you to look at and work with your athletic trainers and medical staff about what needs to be in your bag, who keeps your bag, and make sure that it's restocked. What about medications? There are certain medications, obviously, that we need. The EpiPen, inhalers, analgesics, antibiotics. There are some state-to-state -state issues presently with transporting narcotics across state lines. And there are now some legislator, legislative challenges, also some 
hopeful resolution of this so that the team physician can carry those medications that he or she needs across state lines. Support changes in this so that we can keep what we need in our bag of all medications. Sideline locker room equipment, defibrillator, crutches, stretcher, spine board, cervical collar, fluids for IV hydration. Certainly we need a team plan according to the medical team if there is an emergency, an emergency medical plan of action. I had the privilege of serving as Eastern Kentucky University's team physician alongside with Coach Roy Kidd, who coached for 38 years, and Bobby Barton, who was the athletic trainer for slightly less than that, 34 years. It's great to have a medical team where the coach, the athletic trainer, and the physician communicate very well. And we don't call the plays for Coach Kidd, so he didn't call our medical plays. This is a picture of Coach Kidd on the left, Coach Kidd and his wife, Susan, and Bobby Barton on the right. Communication is what it's all about when being a team physician. Sideline and event management. This is another good review by Aaron Rubin that I would ask that you look at in Sports Medicine Reports. Helps you prepare for the things that you'll see on the sidelines. There are certain musts that we must do as team physicians. We must be prepared. We must practice emergency procedures with athletic trainers and ambulance personnel. We must be prepared for the worst. Have an emergency action plan and practice it. So if you do need to implement it, you'll be ready. This is Hank Gathers as he collapsed from a cardiac event if you look at this from Loyola Marymount, Southern California, you can see he collapses during a game, lies down, tries to get up, lies back down. The medical personnel are there, but no one ever starts cardiac resuscitation. No ABCs. More and more people come out, including his relatives. And there is no emergency action plan. They're there, but they're not doing the ABCs that we all should know how to do. Even the people in the stands should start immediate CPR. Hank Gathers knew of his cardiac condition. And unfortunately, he died. This is something we don't want to have happen. You can see they're bringing the stretcher out. There is a box which looks like it could have been an AED to the left of the screen. So watching a horrific, terrible event like this should really motivate us to be prepared and be ready with that emergency action plan. Family members collapsing on the floor with the word that he had died. A tragedy, the result may have been the same without the emergency action plan. However, we must be ready to implement emergency action plan. Again, never any cardio pulmonary resuscitation was done. Another type of emergency action plan that needs to happen is that with a paralysis. This is Chucky Mullins at Ole Miss who tackled this Vanderbilt player and you can see here where the impact is on the top of his head forcing his neck into flexion and if you look at his left hand, he's already paralyzed there. He was a multiple cervical fracture dislocation and a high 
quadriplegic. The resuscitation plan worked and he was transported to hospital and he actually lived for over a year after this injury. Be prepared, have your ambulance personnel ready and you're in control of the head and neck until the ambulance personnel tell you you're not. At this point, recommendations are to keep the helmet on and establish an airway and stabilize the head and neck. I had the privilege of serving as team physician for the Olympics, and we had Olympic sports festivals. Again, you have to be prepared for everything. Uh, this is Eric Montrose, who played for North Carolina, and he had a laceration. His father was an attorney who sued doctors, so you have to find out who the parents are, uh, but we felt comfortable sewing him up, even though we weren't plastic surgeons, and he was happy. So this is a time to be prepared, but also ask the family certain questions and tell them what you're going to do, and again, communicate with the athletes and the family. This was a happy campster and physician. Dr. George Hersey from Arizona after the laceration was sutured. These are my feet and his 22 feet, so there is a certain difference in uh, the physicians and the athletes, but we have to make sure they know we care for them and we'll do what's in their best interest. During the sports festival in Minneapolis, a roller hockey athlete skated into a door that was opened by a coach and sustained a left tibia fracture. We were in another state that I didn't have privileges, but privileges on a temporary basis were asked for and granted by the Olympic Committee before we got to Minneapolis, so I did have privileges. This was a closed tibia fracture. So we have to be ready to go to the emergency room with our athletes. Hopefully somebody local can accompany us to help us. This was the emergency room that we went to. Did a closed redu reduction and casting, and this is him talking to his family on a phone that has a cord. This was pre-cell phone days. Here's his fracture. He ended up healing without needing a rod. So be ready on the sideline to splint, get them to a hospital where they can be casted. This was another Olympic sports festival in Minneapolis. A soccer athlete, goalie, was kneed in her abdomen and was complaining of severe right upper quadrant pain. She didn't want to come off the field. This is something where you as the physician have to make that call, look in their eyes, see how scared they are. She wanted to keep on playing and be the goalie. We got her to the sidelines. She became hypotensive, got her to the emergency room, did not let her go back into the game, and she ended up having a liver laceration that you can see best here. So this is the liver here, and then there's a split in it. It'd be nice if we could put that liver in a cast, but we can't. So she was observed with sequential hematocrits and ended up doing fine. So here's her spine, vertebral body, here are kidneys, and then here's her liver laceration. It's a scalp film. International competition and coverage as a physician is also very exciting. You have to have a supportive athletic training staff who plans a lot, and the coaches understand you're in a country that isn't the U.S. I was at the World University Games in 1986 in Duisburg, Germany. This was before the wall came down, so this technically was West Germany. And these are the fellow athletic trainers and physicians that were with us. There I am with my cap. This is John Fagan. Lots of other cool people that you get to know through coverage of athletes. So enjoy your time as a team physician. You never know what you're going to be called to do. These were very large balls of the 
uh, globe that were at opening ceremonies, so we had several head bumps, nothing too major, but you never know what's going to be falling from the sky, so try to protect your athletes. Also, when we were over there, the rowers decided to go off on some motorcycles. Fortunately, it was only an ankle sprain, and based on his sport of rowing, he was able to compete, but he had a severe ankle sprain. So the other thing you need to know if you're covering teams is where they are at all times and what trouble they're going to get into. So fortunately, this did not disqualify him from competition, and we were able to do an ankle rehab program, and he was able to row. Picture of him with his air cast. Happy guy. Communication is also a challenge now in the 21st century with cell phones. It's less of a challenge. It used to be a problem uh, in the past. This is in Taiwan, so there are some issues with athletes calling home or talking to coaches from home, etc. This is better and it's easier to communicate, but you also have to remember that we have to communicate eyeball to eyeball and in person. So communicate to your athletic trainers, the coaches, and the athlete. Don't do it all over cell phone. However, you do need to be available by cell phone and answer the phone and communicate. This is a big challenge for us, but as my mentor, Dr. James Andrews, has always done, he says, just pick up the phone and communicate with those involved or related to or who coach the athletes that we take care of. Answer the phone. You'll see a lot of funny things. This was in uh, Germany. Everybody's dressed a little bit differently, language barriers, but pets are pets. Enjoy traveling with your teams. Not often that I've been asked for a signature, except for on a check, but this was uh, somebody that wanted my autograph. Obviously, they didn't know that I wasn't an athlete, but I gave these young people an autograph. I hope they were happy with or if they found out who I really was. But you got to have fun. One of the better parts of being a team physician is establishing relationships with others. And also you get a lot of great stories to laugh about in the future when you reflect on them. What about injections? I do very few injections on the sideline or in the training room. One injection that was uh, a very difficult one for me to make, but one I knew I had to do. This is Davey Johnson. He was our decathlete in 1992 in Barcelona. He had competed in nine events. He had been injected before the ninth event, the, the javelin. He was known to have a navicular stress fracture. He said after the javelin, his foot was hurting so much that he had to have another injection. That was my night off, so I got a chance to go and take pictures in the track venue stadium, and they found me. So they took me underneath the stadium. I uh, was introduced to Davy Johnson, and he says, I have foot pain. I have to have another injection, or I'm not going to run the 1,500 meter, the last event. So I decided to inject him. I was concerned that now a second injection may not help. He may fall down and quit. Would this reflect on my reputation or his? But all, after all, it is the Olympics. This is him finishing. He won a bronze medal, which was pretty phenomenal with a known navicular stress fracture. He made the team. So this is an unusual situation of injecting an athlete. But this was where all the money was on the table for, for him and his last attempt to get a medal in the Olympics. Typically, the decision is made based on what's best for the patient. And in this case, I didn't think it would do further harm since he was going to have to have his navicular operated on anyway. This was his last hurrah. And he kept on standing. A lot of them fell down, but he was uh, one of the last men standing, so to speak. Um, he didn't ever thank me or really know who I was when I did the injection. He did write a chapter in a book 
entitled The Pain in Spain and said that he injected my foot and I felt like I was being crucified. So I did not exist, which made me a little happy too. Know what drugs your athletes are on? These Chinese track athletes, females, were supposedly on no drugs. One could argue differently based on the contour of their thighs and bodies. After we returned from Barcelona in 1992, we were hosted at the White House. And this was the first time I ever saw the gymnast eating meat. It was amazing to see them eat hamburgers. When they were competing, they were eating yogurt and fruit, and I never saw them eat any red meat. So be concerned about our athletes' nutrition and try to make some impact on these young females by counseling them or talking to them about female athlete triad. This was our 1992 crew who went to the White House. They even let us sit in the rooms. It was pretty cool. Jim Montgomery. There I am. I was a swimmer, and not that this German swimmer, Cornelia Ender, was doing any drugs, but she had a very thick body. So you wonder about the past of drug use, particularly anabolic steroids. They do help. They enhance performance. We as team physicians will be asked many things about performance enhancing drugs. With the internet, it makes it a little easier. But one mistake was made when anabolic steroids first were used where physicians said they didn't work. Indeed, they do work, so you lose the confidence that athletes have in you if you tell them they don't work. So they'll tell them what you know about drugs when they ask you. If you don't know it, refer them and you look it up on the internet or reliable sources so you can inform the athlete and answer their questions. This was one of our U.S. swimmers who got second to the East Germans a lot. Be prepared. It might be muddy. Make sure that if it's hot, your athletes have water accessible. They can get really muddy, but if they're wet and muddy, that's even better. Heat illness is preventable. Now there are many more ways to prevent this, and the coaches are on board particularly for medical emergencies that are preventable. We should prevent them before we see one of these. However, on hot days, counseling, now we have wet bulbs and other ways to convince coaches or make coaches not practice during the most hot time of the day. So stick to those protocols. Have a protocol in place for when it's too hot or when it's too cold and stick to it. Deaths do occur. We want to prevent this from happening. As team physicians on the sideline, we must educate players and coaches on field etiquette with the injured player. Don't allow them to pick the player up or move him from the position when he collapsed or was injured. We must decide on reduction techniques and return to play. If you're in a situation where you feel comfortable and have done a reduction, do it. If you feel the deformity is more in the long bone and not at the joint, then get x-rays and have a game plan of where that athlete is going to go. This usually is done with preparation if you're in a conference at different locations. It's a little more difficult at the high school level where you want to make sure if you have a fracture with potential serious problems, you want to get them to a trauma center as opposed to going to several different locations before they're treated. 
This was a subtalar dislocation that I reduced on the field, and he did fine. As team physician, we must be the athlete's protector and advocate. Don't worry or lose sleep over your decisions on the sideline. If you're losing sleep or worrying too much, you're making the wrong decisions. Take your time to evaluate the athlete, get him off the field, and in a quiet area so you can do a better exam. As team physicians, we should share our experiences. The more, the better. This was my Eastern Kentucky team with several physicians who were at a conference. Bobby Barton, the athletic trainer at Eastern Kentucky University, Mark Hutchinson, Sandy Hoffman, Sue Ott, and Peter Gerbino. Enjoy and share experiences. You are always on call. This was me in Africa. I had to start an IV on a landowner who had been gored by an elephant. When I was called to see him, I didn't know if he'd be alive, dead, what color he was, what diseases he had. This was the elephant that gored him. Fortunately, he had non-life-threatening injuries. This is the Samburu tribe people and this three-year-old elephant with those little tusks that created fasciotomies down both of his calves and his thigh. He did have some bleeding going on, but he also had a back injury. He was complaining of back pain and ended up having a vertebral body fracture at a couple of levels from this elephant pushing him into flexion of the lumbar spine as he was trying to run away through these dense bushes. Be prepared. Do what you can. At least try. Thank you for your attention.